Hello, my regulars, and welcome new listeners to the Reese on the Regular podcast. Today, I'm here with the wonderful Janine. Hi, everyone. I'm Janine Wright. I own Fit Life, a wellness and fitness studio in Melrose, Massachusetts. I am a nutrition educator. I work with many different diverse clientele for nutrition coaching or personal training. And I just started a podcast recently called It's Already In You. So exciting. (laughs) Everyone has to go and listen. Fun fact, Janine actually inspired me to start my podcast. So I'm so excited to hear that she has her own podcast now. And it's awesome. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today is going to be kind of what you talk about on the podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about truth versus trends when it comes to your food habits and healthy eating and just how people are telling you what you want to hear versus the truth because Janine has a lot to share with us (laughs) on that. She's been learning about it and studying it for a long time. I guess I want to start by asking like what started your passion? Yeah so I want to say it's I have a 19 year old now. When I was pregnant of course that's when I mean I've been in the fitness and wellness space for a very long time Mm -hmm. over 30 years And when I was pregnant, I just started really thinking about, you know, what I was eating while I was pregnant and really thinking about it in a different way, you Mm -hmm. know, like in like the 80s or 90s when you would exercise and your goal was to be thin and be fit and you would eat things like you know, steamed broccoli and grilled chicken and (laughs) Diet Coke (laughs) because there was no calories in Diet Coke. And that was like the healthy way to eat, right? Mm -hmm. Like the fit way to eat. I never really thought about it. When I got married, my sister-in-law was very, you know, she just researched food and the way that other countries ate and Mm -hmm. the way their food system was. And she would tell us a lot of things and we would think she was totally earthy crunchy yeah (laughs) like oh my god what is she talking about right (laughs) yeah my mother-in-law was diagnosed with cancer when I was pregnant with my second daughter Mm -hmm. and I really dug my heels in and started to research what was going on in America that we had so much disease and it was so associated with our diet Mm -hmm. and our lifestyle and As a wellness professional, I was like, what am I doing? Like, I'm not helping anybody if I don't change their behaviors around food. Right. And I learned a lot. I researched and and I'm talking peer reviewed literature like it wasn't I wasn't Googling things. I was because like we're going to talk about today. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. Not the Um, truth on there. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, I really dug deep into what was different in Western medicine versus other countries, Europe and Asia, and the disease in those other countries compared to America. I read a lot of books. I watched a lot of documentaries. Mm -hmm. I even had to like, you know, people think they hear something and they just take the word for it, especially if it's somebody that is a doctor or Mm -hmm. a nutritionist or a nutrition expert, right? And I didn't do that. I didn't take the word of anyone. I now I have a lot of people that I know like who to trust and right. who I know are looking through the research, the peer reviewed literature and seeing the difference. But I also think that you know science can be funny. Like today it could come out with something and 5 years from now it, we could see something totally different or if you don't know if the study was actually done well, if the subjects were were good subjects or, you know, if there was a placebo effect, if it was double blind, there's so many things that you need to look at. Right. So I looked at a lot of things (laughs) and studied a lot of things. And then I started, um, I was a health promotion director for a pharmaceutical company of all things. I started doing seminars with the medical director and you know, we went like deep down into like the science of things like from the Krebs cycle. And then I started really thinking about how food affects us on a cellular level and how much disease it was causing. And it changed like the trajectory of the way that I was going to coach people and educate people on nutrition yeah. forever. And was this while you were still pregnant? Yes. My yeah. mother-in-law passed the day after I brought my baby home from the hospital. Yeah, that's really great that you were able to research that, having your first kids and know that right away. Yeah. 
That's really cool. Yeah, and I did a lot, like, for them, I educated them a lot. So mm -hmm. it was never like, you can't have this. It was, well, the reason why we don't choose these foods or, or you know, these ingredients was mostly, like, I never really took anything, any food groups out of my children's lives unless there was an issue, which, right, which one is of important. my children, it's dairy. But it wasn't about taking food any food out of their life. It was about them understanding that there is quality foods and then there is not quality foods. Mm -hmm. And those not quality foods are what I truly believe is making America sick. Yeah, for sure. And I know we were just talking about how I spent the last four months in Europe and felt yes. great and suddenly don't feel great coming home. So it is really frustrating when we can't do much about it. But you know, the best thing you can do is your own research and educating your kids and things like that. So I think that's great. Yeah. The hard thing is when a food affects you, it is, even if it's not an allergy, it is the same thing mm -hmm. as an allergy. You can't have it. You yeah. know, you can't, you can't have a little red dye number 40. You can't have some hormones and it be healthy because at the end of the day, if it affects your body to the point where it makes you feel sick or gives you migraines or you have digestive issues mm -hmm. or, you know, the list goes on and on. There's so many things that are connected to food with right. us. Like I've, I've had children that have stutters from artificial sweeteners or from dyes or behavioral issues or yeah. neurological stuff. Like the list is just, we could sit here all <laughs> day and talk about how food is affecting us. I know, we're worried this might be too long because yeah. there's so much to talk about. I think a lot of people do think of it as like, oh, you need to be diagnosed with some sort of allergy to have to eliminate foods and things like that. But I mean, even just for me, like a small intolerance to certain foods like gluten, dairy, I got to stay away from, even though I'm not celiac or allergic, it's just, right. you know, those things don't agree with me. And in America. It's tough in, in America, <laughs> and it's tough. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, your gut health was affected by the American food system. Right. And now there's foods that you can't have because your gut is having a problem mm -hmm. with digesting them. And, you know, that's a big topic, gut health, and, you know, trying to improve your gut health and trying to almost reverse the effects of this food system. But if you continue to eat toxic things... Mm -hmm your systems are going to continue to give you that feedback of that you're not going to be able to eat certain foods. Right. I hear a lot of people say, oh, I started eating healthy and I felt worse than I did before, you know. Well, that's also, that's a transition. Yeah. And, you know, it's like anything that we do that isn't healthy for us, when you stop it, your body doesn't feel great. It's no. withdrawing from those things. There's so much to it, but... If you go back to the basics and you think like you want things that are grown with the least amount of chemicals mm -hmm. and the most conscientious farming practices, then you're going to start to heal not only your gut, but the environment around you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're so connected to nature that people don't understand that that's where it begins, mm -hmm. like our soil and our air. And then the list goes on and it's on and it's on. such a big picture the whole thing and even just you know people who say oh I tried eating healthy it's like do they even really know what that is because of all the miscommunication yes. <laughs> that goes on and there's misinformation which I feel like obviously isn't intentionally put out there right it's you learn something and you believe in it and you know there's curriculum in college that's funded by the food system and food mm -hmm. big business. And it makes me crazy when you hear things like mayonnaise is a good fat, you know? <laughs> well, Hellman's paid for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know I shouldn't like pinpoint anything <laughs> specifically, but, but, but like it's probably funded by the, the organization or the company, the business that is producing that product, right? right. Whereas like avocados are a good fat, mm -hmm. right? Coconut is a good fat. Yeah. But like those are things that nobody can create mm -hmm. they're already it's just yeah they're in nature so it's it's really hard but there is disinformation out there too and mm -hmm. you have to be really careful like if somebody's making money off of what they're selling a lot of times they're trying to find the backing for their information to mm -hmm. sell their product or their of course book or their 
Yeah. And that's where things, you know, get a little get tricky. sketchy mm -hmm. and tricky. And, and it's sad because that's how that information gets out there. So what are some recent food trends that you've noticed have influenced people's false perceptions and all that miscommunication when it comes to unhealthy versus healthy foods? I think a big trend that's really <laughs> getting under <laughs> my skin right now is that where I see a lot of influencers and professionals that are saying things that people want to hear mm -hmm. rather than telling them the truth to what they need to hear. So for an example, um, <laughs> there are foods that we love as Americans and, and food is very cultural and food is part of your upbringing. It's part of your memories. Mm -hmm. You know, like I remember things growing up like having Pop-Tarts on Saturdays or whatever. Like you remember these things. And so it becomes something more than just your nourishment, right? right. Or it's like the nostalgia and how you're brought up. Yeah. It, like all factors into it. Right. And I think that some people want the reassurance that, you know, I love Diet Coke. And, you know, if I see somebody that is going to tell me how to get healthier, they're going to tell me I can never have that. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we've gone away from like, don't ever say never, you know, mm -hmm. like you can never say never. And I don't like it. Yeah. I, I think we're, we're doing a disservice to people that we're working with. If you came to me and you were like, you know, I eat Oreo cookies every day and I love them. Well, let's find something that may be homemade or better ingredients that you can eat that will make you feel like you are getting your cookie that yeah. makes you feel so great. But let's know that it's still sugar no matter how what the ingredients are right. and let's know that we can we can get a better ingredient eat less of it still feel that nostalgia and be excited about it but do better for our body and mm -hmm. our health you know what i mean like 100 percent, yeah it's you don't need to eat the oreo <laughs> I, and and like you said it is nostalgic like my kids i didn't feed high fructose corn syrup and hormones and dyes and we went to a farmer's market in Vermont, and I'll never forget how I felt. Like, I saw a snow cone, mm -hmm. and it was made with blueberries and maple syrup. And you would have thought I hit the lottery, <laughs> like, to give my kids a snow cone. Yeah. Or they had cotton candy that didn't have any dyes in it. Mm -hmm. And I was so overly excited about my kids being able to have that, mm -hmm. where... Like now, in retrospect, I wish the, the education was more like, okay, but it's still sugar, and it's not something that we should be so excited about. Right. We should be excited, and I am. When I look at a child's, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends that, that their kids are two and three years old, and they're doing such an amazing job, like getting nutrients into these little bodies. Eating's a learned behavior. Yeah. So seeing a child eat nutrients <laughs> is like the most <laughs> beautiful thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Like when you really think how it affects cells, like you're talking about tissue, like deep layers of your body that are either going to prevent you from getting chronic illness and disease, mm. or they're gonna contribute to you getting chronic illness and disease. Right. You know, and I think we're so scared of putting people on the defense or, or making people feel bad for what they've done that we now just let them hear what they want to hear so that they like us or they continue to follow us. And it's not my job to make you feel better mm -hmm. about what you're doing. It's my job to teach you how you can feel better about what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. and I and I know it's really hard, especially I think generationally. Yeah, like, I know. And we just did a podcast on this. Like, if you're if you go out and you have a day where not everything was perfectly healthy, <laughs> right? We tend to go within ourselves and say, mm -hmm. "I was bad this weekend." Yeah. And we just did this this episode saying that like it's not you <laughs> that's bad. No. <laughs> But unfortunately, what you chose was not the best option, right? That's all it is, yeah. But you can't beat yourself up. No. You have to move on to the next meal and make better choices. Mm -hmm. Because what we, do, what we tend to do is we say, okay, I was bad, so now I can't 
reverse that. So I'm just going to be bad till yeah. the end of December. And on January 1st, I'll be good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or on Monday, I'll stop being yep. good. But then we have months or weeks or days that we could have made better decisions. Right. So reeling it back in and saying, okay, so I went out. It is what it is. It's a new day. I had fun. <laughs> but it's, a, it's the next meal. Or tomorrow's a new day. And yeah. I'm just going to now make better decisions or better than decisions. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to reel it back in instead of having days or weeks of beating myself up about it. Right. But that should be the message. Not, okay, well, that was okay. <laughs> and you can do that whenever you want. Yeah. Because you should feel like you can, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there's, there's a lot to be said. And it's because of diet culture. And it's because of, you know, eating disorders and all of those things, but mm -hmm. educating people and learning the difference between like, these are just really toxic ingredients versus if you want to have ice cream, choose the ice cream with the good ingredients right? and have a little less and enjoy and be mindful about eating it and take your time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and make it be a good experience. Yeah rather than always having this like internal fight with yourself. And I definitely think a lot of it is generational for sure. Did you ever run into any issues like as your kids were growing up and social media is becoming a bigger thing and the generation's changing of like what you yeah. taught them when they were younger? I have to say I'm really lucky because I started immediately, mm -hmm. right? I have a lot of parents that will say, you know, you're, you've done this since the beginning. I, I have an eight-year-old. Try telling an eight-year-old that the hoodsie at school that everybody else is eating <laughs> is not okay anymore, right. right? I mean, my kids at some points were telling me, like, ah, oh, mom, I don't think we should have that. There's probably GMOs <laughs> in it. Like, we'd be at places where I'd have not a lot of control, right. you know? And we'd have to make choices that were within our abilities at that point mm -hmm. and a lot of times my kids would say oh I'm not gonna I'm not gonna eat that so go find me a farm to table restaurant or <laughs> find us somewhere we could eat we're gonna just eat when we leave and I'd be like wow okay yeah, it's so rare mm -hmm. but then you run into teenage years mm -hmm. you know consistency is important mm -hmm. but I also tell my parents you know when you give in to anything and it's bedtime or you know, a, a movie or whatever it may be, as soon as you give in to that, you're opening that door mm -hmm. because you're saying it's not that bad, right? Yeah. Like, so you can have, you can, you can stay out till 1130 instead of 11. And then all of a sudden that's their new time that they're right. coming home, right? It's the same thing with anything like that. Discipline, bedtime, food. If I opened the door and I did for some things like I would say, OK, well, you know, I don't I'm not going to ever tell you that fast food is good for you. But there are some places that do a better job with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like Chipotle tries to stay away from hormones and GMOs and certain things. So that was our choice mm -hmm. for fast food. You know, now. Years have gone by and I've learned more. And you know, that's the other thing. My kids are like, oh, no, she's learning more. Yeah. They see me researching or they see me in a course and they're like, something's going to happen now. But at some points you have to say, like, we live in this country and mm -hmm. we have to always think that we have to make the better than choice because we're it's culture, it's society. It's and there's only so much that we can do. So I want them to be able to go to restaurants that they can afford with their friends. Right. And so if it's Chipotle over the other worse options, <laughs> then, then that's what I have to accept and be good with. But I have to say, for the most part, I, I feel really good about what they've learned. Now I have a college student, so yeah. <laughs> she hates the food at school, <sighs> but we have no choice. It's tough. It's tough. <laughs> she chooses mostly vegetarian, mm -hmm. you know, and, and does the best she can with yeah. it. Are there any specific strategies you use or that you've tried to teach your daughters when it comes to grocery shopping, planning your food, cooking it, and especially with your daughter being in college? Yes. So being prepared, as you know, freshman year is you have no choice. You're paying that big amount of money for <laughs> 
the biggest meal plan that you can get at school. But as you're there for a while and then when you move into your apartment and then you have better options and better choices, right? obviously. But I tell them that they need to be prepared, right? If you're out and you know you're going to be out all day and you don't have access to healthier options or better options, then you're going to end up making Mm -hmm. worse choices, right? But meal prepping is not for everybody, especially (laughs) younger people that are, you know, they don't have structure. I mean, you're a little different. (laughs) (laughs) I I watch you and I'm like, if everybody could be like Reese. Um, But the truth of the matter is, is is not everybody has that discipline, right? right? Unfortunately, you have that discipline because you've not felt good <laughs> when you don't exactly have yeah sometimes but, you need a reason to yeah cook but your some own people food. don't know they can't associate what they're taking in or what they're putting on their body or what's surrounding them with how they're feeling right some people could get migraines or stomach issues or and they don't associate it with food right they just have a dis- i think we have a, a big disassociation with how much nutrition affects us Mm -hmm. how much food affects us but if you can start thinking about maybe you're not a meal planner for seven days maybe you're a meal planner in the morning for the day Mm -hmm. maybe you're a okay I am going to be eating out and maybe you're a restaurant planner you know and you start thinking about all right where am I going to go what is the best option that's around me and what are the best choices at that restaurant Mm -hmm. and how can I make it better right? Maybe that's what you start with. Maybe you start with just putting things, adding things onto your plate and it starts to crowd out the stuff that's not that great, Mm -hmm. right? And I've worked with, like I say that there's a spectrum and, you know, here you're like eating fast food every single day and on this end of the spectrum, you have like got it down. You're meal planning, you're, you know, making all those great choices, you're scheduled, yeah. And but wherever you fall on that spectrum, you can always get better. You can always continue to make things better than they were before, right? right. Um, but I think that you just need to, again, look at it like if I bring something into my diet that has so many nutrients and I start to feel like, wow, I wasn't craving anything or you know, I wasn't hungry, like Mm -hmm. the satiety was good, I must be doing something right, then the stuff that's not that great will start to go away. You know, there are people that we have to start really slow with. There are people that will come to me for coaching or come to a seminar and hear all these things and they'll take a garbage bag and start emptying pantries and refrigerators (laughs) and they're like, I'm never going back, you know? Sounds like my mom. (laughs) And then there's other people, though, that will like, well, I have to finish this before I yeah. start the new mm-hmm. ingredient one, you know, like, <laughs> and it's very interesting that the, the span obviously is, is across the board on, and across the spectrum of, of where we are. And we have to respect that. And it's with anything like lifestyle changes, right? There's people that can go work out every single day and they're moving every day and they just have that. It's part of their calendar it's Mm -hmm. on their calendar I'm working out every day at 10 and there's other people that are like I went three times this week and that's great yeah you went three times right like you didn't go at all last week it is trying to make it into a lifestyle Mm -hmm. it's trying to make the changes happen so that they become part of our life and not not a burden to us you know, and if, if that means starting really slow and adding things in, if it means just drinking more water, mm-hmm. right? For the first three weeks, all I'm going to do is drink more water <laughs> in a glass jar <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> from a filter. <laughs> but that, that could be what it is. I also, not to plug this, and but, but to plug this, I have a journal coming out and it's called Live Better. And it's just like resources and like things to help you think about what you do yeah. on a daily basis to start making these small little changes. That's cool. Yeah. Like a journal, like book type thing yeah, that you wrote? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I know. I'm really excited about it, but it's hard for me because I don't want it to be like something I have to sell, but I have to pay for it. To right, be yeah. <laughs> so this is where like it, it's hard, right? Because do this from my heart. Like mm-hmm. when I teach seminars or 
I do get paid because it is my profession, but it's one of those things where I don't, I don't like that piece of it because mm -hmm. my passion is to, to like make your life better and yeah. make you thrive in life. And people will say, oh, so you want to live to your like a hundred? <laughs> it's not that. No. I, I don't, it's not the number. It's the quality. Yeah. Right? You want to like, feel good while you're here. I want to feel good. I want to watch <laughs> the people that I love grow old and be able to ski down a hill when they're 80 and mm. feel great about it and not be living their life trying to figure out how they're paying for their medicine or the things that they have to do to catch up with the health that they could have caught up, they could have been working on the whole time, right? Yeah. So, and I, I hope that we're heading in this direction in Western medicine that we're going to start focusing on better prevention mm -hmm. and better lifestyles because it's going to save our, us on healthcare. It, it, it's just, there's so much to... Yeah to this that I, I really wish it was more in the front of people's minds. Right. A you lot know? that people don't think about because they just don't know. Well, and it's inconvenient mm -hmm. at first, right? The like convenience, the cost. Yeah. I mean, even you're saying, you know, you don't want to have to put a cost on a yeah. journal like that, but food that's healthier, the costs and things like that that I feel like people run into so they just avoid it for the convenience. Yeah. And a lot of it is common sense mm -hmm. because of the amount of information that's thrown at us day to day, right? I'm really educated in this area and I will open social media and, you know, whether it's I'm feeling like, oh, I, I'm not as energetic as I, as I was or I'm going through perimenopause or, you know, I've gained a little weight because I'm, I'm at that stage of my life, right? Mm -hmm. Every single thing on social media is supplements that are like wiggling back mm -hmm. and forth in front of you, like <laughs> lose more weight, feel more energy. Like anything that I feel is like it, on social media in yeah, my face. They just have found a way to market everything where it's it just, incredible. You fall for it. Yes. So fast. And <laughs> even the most educated of us that know better, mm -hmm. you know, I always use this example, like after I had a baby. And I'm seeing like Daisy Fuentes talk about Windsor Pilates. Like mm -hmm. I'm an exercise physiologist, nutrition educator, like teach Pilates. Like I, I still like at 2 a.m. feeding my baby was thinking I want to look like her. Yeah. I, I should buy that program. Right. Like and of course, then you you're like, OK, I know. <laughs> This is like way too good to be true. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But there are things that are on the market that may work for a short period of time. Right. And then they can affect our health in negative ways. I think people find a hard time putting health first. It's more a vanity thing a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. Like so until you start to feel your health decline, you're just looking for the, the easiest, fastest mm -hmm. way to the way you want to look. Right on the outside, you know? Yeah. I wish that we could see the way that we're looking on the inside. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Wouldn't that be <laughs> awesome? It would change us. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like exercise. If you could exercise and get a result immediately, yeah. think about how much more you would exercise, mm -hmm. right? When I teach an IQ, I feel the muscles that I'm supposed to be engaging and connecting to. And I always say to everyone, like, it's so amazing when you really connect and you're mindful of what you're doing, you think like, I'm gonna lift my shirt up and it's gonna be like an eight pack, like that's how <laughs> strong I feel and how good I feel, right? Yeah. If we could somehow start to put that together with like, if you start to add nutrient dense foods mm -hmm. into your life and you take away like calorie dense, no nutrient availability of foods, in your diet, you're gonna start to feel so much better. It's like, and you're, and you will look better, mm -hmm. right? And you will age slower and so you yeah. will be more fertile and you <laughs> will, you know, like there are so many things. And I just, I wish that people were taught this yeah. throughout their life. Exactly, because if they were, then it would be more of an immediate thing for people. Yes. It wouldn't just be this convenience that everyone lives on. It's so hard. <laughs> It it's is so hard and, and like because yeah. I never want to make people feel bad. No, right? and there's not enough people like you who are educated where it's like, 
okay, everyone's just going to listen to that. Yeah. You know? It's hard. Mm -hmm. But then there are people that you think are so educated. Uh -huh. And you get caught up in it. Yeah. You know? You have to be a critical thinker. And, and not everybody is. But, like, you have to really think about, like, huh, like, that person says beans are bad, and that person saying that vegetables can kill us. <laughs> and, you know, and then you have to step back and you have to say, wait a second. <laughs> there are some countries <laughs> that their major intake, like their most intake is vegetables. Right. <laughs> and for hundreds and thousands of years, we have seen that they are the healthiest places on the planet, right? Like there are, there's something called blue zones. Did you ever hear of that? No. So there are, I think there's five, and I could be wrong. I'm, I have way too much information in my head. <laughs> um, there's even a, a documentary or a series on Netflix right now about the blue zones. Really? Yeah, and it's really interesting. But Sardinia, Italy, mm -hmm. Okinawa, Japan is one of them. Costa Rica is another. There's one place in America, and it's in California. I think it's... Loma Linda, but these places, they look at their lifestyle and what they take in as far as nutrition goes. And the things that are all similar in all of these places lead to the healthiest sentitarians. Is that how I say that? How do you say? Hundred year olds. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those words you can never Honestly, say. Honestly, don't even know the word. So it's they they made it to 100 years old but they're the healthiest mm -hmm. of of that age group yeah and they notice that they eat mostly plants mm -hmm. they have really good relationships and community you know their stress level is is not high they take care of themselves by doing things that are self care you know they don't drink a lot there's they move every yeah. day like th so there's there's like these um little pillars of, of the way that they care for themselves and, and their community. And, and these are the healthiest places in the world. That's so, I've never heard of the blue zones. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, but it is that, that common sense of like, people could just look into that and why would you think vegetables are bad when there's yeah. those statistics out there? Right. I mean, and we've known this since. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that is know. just common sense alone. You shouldn't even have to know yeah. about the blue zones, but but to not be hypocritical, we've also been seeing milk does a body good for yeah. a long time, right? But that is advertisements. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference, yeah. right? Like, that is a big industry. And then I think this is a really good point to bring up is that we have to remember that you, um, you have industry in America that is very tied politically. And there's lobbyists and there's a lot of money around it. And that's when things get skewed. But you see something that has been, you know, told to you that has been healthy for the longest, longest time and it's been marketed to you that way. And if you saw the, the commercials, like back in the beginning of when commercials were starting to be a thing for industry about dairy, like, I mean, there was a commercial that would, that showed like, and it was like geared towards kids because like you're eating your cereal and if you don't drink your milk, like you have really bad bones. Oh, my bones doctor and, like, used to yell at me all the time. Oh, yeah. And somebody's <laughs> outside like, and all their bones are like, breaking. <laughs> like that was the ad, oh you know? My God. And I'm like, oh, this is terrible. Terrible. Like, but there used to be ads for doctors smoking camel cigarettes. And mm -hmm. so you really got to think about where it's coming from. But there's also the other side where when something starts to be acknowledged by society, like, hmm, maybe that isn't the healthiest thing that we should be putting in our body. Then they attack the opposing. Mm -hmm. So like, do you remember soy was getting such a bad name for a little while? Organic soy products have been eaten in Southeast Asia for, that's their like, their like main, main part yeah. of their diet. And there's very little cancers over there. There's very little diabetes. And if you've never read the China studies, that's something that's very interesting. But they, they look at like epidemiological studies and these are like real life for years, watching the way people live and the outcomes of how their lifestyle has been, what they've eaten over years. So if you say to yourself like, oh, 
that doesn't sound right, it probably isn't right. Right. You know, or if that sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. Supplements are a probably a trillion dollar industry now. Mm -hmm. Right? Like yeah. I know 10 years ago the statistic was like a 90 billion dollar industry. So we're we're definitely <laughs> beyond there. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 5% of Americans have are nutrient dense, like are nutrient efficient. Yeah. Are getting what they need. 5% and you're talking a trillion dollar industry in supplements. So supplements aren't giving us what we need. No, so it's just important to look at the results in people's lifestyle and what they're eating, and that's really the best way to determine the truth. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and knowing there's place for things, mm -hmm. right? If you have a deficiency, there are very good quality, third party, whole food supplements that you can, you know, put a little bit more trust in. And of if course. you have a deficiency, then then you can use those things to help you. But that's the other thing is we don't really, we're not testing the way that we should be for our deficiencies and knowing what people need. And, you know, the numbers are like moments in time and trying to figure out what's going on with our health is, is really, we, we need more diagnostics, mm -hmm. and more preventable ways to tell what people need, you know? Yeah. So it's, it, it is hard. It's difficult. But if you eat a whole food nutrient rich diet, I don't think you need to even think of anything else. You yeah. need to like, you know, focus on that first. Mm -hmm. Start there. When it comes to other things that you're purchasing when you're grocery shopping, you know, ingredients lists, things like that, that aren't just these whole foods. What is your advice for navigating through all these ingredients? Because I know you can pull something out of an ingredients yeah. list that like people don't really think of. Yeah. I would say being able to identify the ingredients mm -hmm. is first and foremost. So if you don't know what something is. Can't pronounce it. Can't pronounce it. <laughs> if there's a lot of ingredients on a label, then you probably should just red avoid flag. it. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a red flag. It's hard because there's so much label craziness out there. There's health claims on food products. And as far as I'm concerned, if it comes in a box, a bag, a can, you can't listen to the health claims. Mm -hmm. So that's the best thing you can start with, right? right? Maybe, maybe if it is a whole food, what it says on the package might have some truth in it. But for the most part, labeling is to get you to buy the product. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at the number of ingredients. You're looking at the ability to understand what the ingredients are and if you can identify what they are. Um, you know, Michael Pollan says if it wasn't in your grandmother's cabinet <laughs> or, you, or your grandmother doesn't know what it was, you probably shouldn't buy it. Yeah. And I love that. If it was made in a plant, you shouldn't need it. But if it was made by a plant, you, you can. You know, he has some great quotes. And there's a lot of things out there that, that we should definitely be avoiding completely. But, you know, I'm going to say that organic is, is your best option. It's your better than option. Is it, is it like the most optimal in this country? You know, people are always saying like, oh, well, I heard that they do this to organic food. At the end of the day, I have to trust that it is better than industrialized, factory-made foods, right? Like that there, are, there is some wholesomeness and that it's still the better option, right? So if we go down that rabbit hole of, well, I heard Trader Joe's lies about these things, all right, you know? <laughs> you're going to get yourself so crazy that you're not going to be able to make those decisions. Right. So you have to come to terms with the fact that we do live in America and that we have to make the best choices we can make. Farmers markets are great, but they're also Americanized. They're mm -hmm. turning into these places where like people are selling, you know, anything that they are selling. Like right. I, 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 it makes me so mad. Like <laughs> farmers markets should be natural. Right. You it's shouldn't show up at a farmer's changed. market and see M&Ms in a cookie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like real dark chocolate chips or find like no, the... the become like fairs and... Yeah. It's and it's sad. It's like, but you do want to support local. And of local course. is like your, the less miles that food has to... I mean, again, we could go, <laughs> we could have 22 episodes on, yeah, on all the different things. But 
if it if it is local and you can speak to the farmer and you can know their practices, that's always going to be the best because you're supporting that farmer, you're voting with your dollar, you're also getting better than what is going to the grocery store that's traveled thousand miles. Right. But you do want to know, like you know, it's great to know where your food's coming from and how they what their practices are. But a lot of farmers can't afford to you to get the the USDA organic label or to go through the processes that they need to get there. So that's the other issue. But I do still believe that choosing local but organic is going to be the best mm -hmm. choice that you can make. Yeah. Do you feel like anyone has ever come to you with certain foods or things that they found that they kind of misunderstood as organic or like any oh, misleading yes. labels that you can speak on? Yeah. So the labeling is tough. Mm -hmm. A lot of things say non-GMO now mm -hmm. that are not, um, you know, there's non-GMO verified and then there's non-GMO ingredients and then there's organic label and then there's organic ingredients and then there's how much of it has to be, you right. know. And again, you could go crazy, but if you're trying to stick to 100% non-GMO organic foods, then the USDA organic label needs to be on the product, the mm -hmm. food, the package. And it's hard, right? Like you see farm fresh and you think, oh, it's farm fresh. So yeah. it's going to be non-GMO, right? <laughs> no. No, <laughs> not necessarily. So... It's really hard. 90% of corn in America is genetically modified. 90% of soy is genetically modified. Alfalfa, now beets are the, the getting up there in, in how much we have that's genetically modified. So these are the crops you have to be careful of. And then there's ingredients in foods that absorbic acid comes from corn, but you might not know that, right? right? <laughs> so again, I would say you want to see that it is is certified non-GMO, non-GMO verified, rather than just saying that there's non-GMO ingredients. Right. Right, because if they say that, then some of the ingredients can be non-GMO, but then some of the ingredients can be GMO, and you wonder why they do that, but then it's a cost. Yeah. It, it's, hard. They, it's hard. Yeah, they can put that on there because it's not lying, but right. it's not the full truth. Right. Natural is a terrible, terrible <laughs> label. <laughs> like, everybody's like, well, it's natural. You know, <laughs> or I hear all the time, I bought it at Whole Foods. Yeah. That the doesn't store, I know. Store doesn't say much either. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't. They're a business mm -hmm. and they have to make money, right? And however they're going to do that, they have to do that. And it's unfortunate. But again, I feel like you want to get, try not to get so caught up in that. Like if you can't even deal with looking at that stuff, if most of your food is vegetables and whole foods you're better than eating a, a lot of processed and ultra processed right. foods because that's our biggest problem in america mm -hmm. i mean 60 percent or more of our diet is processed foods crazy it's so crazy yeah there's a book um ultra processed people hmm. it's really good you should read it it's a doctor from the uk okay. is trying to get his twin brother who's also a doctor to stop eating Processed Ultra foods processed foods. Um, now there's an acronym, UPF, we call it, because now not only are we seeing that the American diet is processed, but now it's ultra processed. Mm -hmm. So we're taking it to the next level. Like our, our bodies are not doing any of the things they're supposed to do. Right. Digesting, mm -mm. you know, like that whole process is where we get our nutrients from. So if something, it's like eating already digested food. Yeah. <laughs> That's weird to think about weird to think about <laughs> it sounds like it'd be a good book it, it's it was interesting <laughs> and I, your journal I listened it to, i listened to it. you've it, definitely done a lot more research than me but i do feel like i've had to do a lot of research like i talked about with just my own diet and having to learn what really works well with my body and what doesn't my diet has changed a lot over the years i probably ate like 90% processed food, like when I was younger and growing up and just eating that. all the things that kids eat. I My diet was so different. I definitely 
think a lot changed when my mom met you <laughs> um, <laughs> and when your daughters would come over and no, my mom started to become really aware. So she did make a lot of changes in our house, which was great, but I was still having a lot of troubles. And so I went to more of a holistic nutritionist and that's where I learned a lot about what things weren't agreeing with my body. So I started to get into cooking for myself and cutting out certain things and definitely felt a lot greater. And so it's been really great, but at the same time, I do feel like it's tough with social media and all the false information out there, yeah. but it's good to learn so much today and to know that there's resources out there, Netflix and books and your own stuff that you're coming out with. And you guys have to go and listen to her podcast because we could talk forever about this topic. There's really just so much to say. And so I guess I want to end this off and just asking any you know additional resources that people can use at this point to make research easier on them <laughs> yes well i mean your listeners can also always reach out to you and ask you how you've made these changes and of course sometimes like you know your peers it feels good to know what they've done to make positive changes and have outcomes that have been so great <laughs> i already do feel like a lot of my friends are always like how do you do it and like they yeah. try and do it with me sometimes yeah. and it is tough but I mean, when it makes you feel better, it's so worth it. And it yeah. just becomes a habit for sure. And you post a lot on I try, meal yeah. planning <laughs> and meal prepping and stuff like that. And I, I love it. Not everything is going to be 100% right. So I just always want to preface it with that, that you have to critically think. But I do believe that there's a lot of information out there that you can start to look into. Like like you said, there's Netflix um, documentaries that I do just think start opening your eyes to what's going on. You know, Food Inc. was a huge documentary for people in the United States that they, you know, started to see that that, that was like the first, one of the first documentaries that showed like what's going on in our farming and factory farm. I read Organic Manifesto, one of the first books that I read that is written by Maria Rodal and it's Rodale Institute. They're the first organic farm in America. It's pretty cool. cool. She She's like, that book was awesome because it just like makes you think of what's supposed to be going on in our food system and farming and how it's so not that, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything that's at a farm contributes to everything that's supposed to be there, right? You can't just have corn no. growing at a farm. <laughs> you need to have animals that are fertilizing the soil and having really good oxygenated so like there's so much to it and do it in like pieces right like double click on something and and listen to it and critically think about it and you know watch watch a documentary and then that documentary will lead to something else or if you like to read michael pollan is a journalist that really dove into the nutrition world and the food system and i think he's opened a lot of eyes and and made a lot of things happen positive things happen so there there's a lot of resources out there and if if they want to email me or you want to share my email i will i will attach everything i definitely think it's important to do what works for you, whether that is listening to a podcast or reading a book, because yes. you don't want it to start to feel like a chore. It no. should be something that you find an interest in some way, yeah. shape or form. And it's great that there are all those different resources out there. Just finding what works for you is the most important part and yes. hopefully gaining an interest in it, finding yourself diving deeper into it. Cause I feel like that's kind of how you started, you know, it was just yeah. a little something and now it's like become your passion. Yes. So that's awesome. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on. And I'm going to share everything with you guys. This was Thank awesome. I learned me. so much. I want to have you back on. Maybe we can ask them what they want to talk about. Specifically. <laughs> yes. So we can I know. focus in, like, <laughs> zoom in on something that. Yes, this was definitely like big picture overview but yeah. please comment and give feedback on what you guys specifically want to hear about when it comes to your health and nutrition and really anything yes. in that matter <laughs> but this was so much fun thank you so much <laughs> all right guys keep listening keep watching give all the feedback and we'll see you soon bye bye <laughs>